to talk about um, my um, paper, our um, research um, study of our Chiari patients. And um, this is um, coming out in November in uh, World Neurosurgery, but it's available now online. So this is a surgical decompression for Chiari type 1, which is an age-based comparison. So when we talk about, you know, Chiari, we're interested in outcomes, right? And in the last 10 years, there have been several papers talking about the natural history of Chiari malformation. Um, these are several of those. All of these studies have included asymptomatic patients um, or patients who are, you know, mildly symptomatic. The first one um, is out in this current episode or current issue of World Neurosurgery. And it's not entirely clear what mild or mildly symptomatic is. You presume it's not debilitating symptoms. You know, kids are still going to school, people are still working, and they're not taking medication every day and so on. But uh, basically when we look at symptomatic patients in all of these studies, they all show about 40% or less improvement in, um, in the symptoms just spontaneously. We know that Chiari malformation can just develop on its own um, over time or it can regress. This is a patient of mine and the slide on the um, right here is when she was eight weeks old and it was done because she had had a possible seizure, ended up not having seizures. This is the same patient at two years old. She is, remains completely asymptomatic. She's four years old. She gave me some gray hairs, but I didn't uh, decompress her. She started walking at 10 months, no swallowing problems, no delays, no problems, and so we're just watching her. But we've also seen the same thing, of course, happen, right? The Chiari malformation kind of ascend a few millimeters or almost back to normal. Now, this is um, uh, Rick Boop's uh, paper, which came out in 2015, looking at um, uh, over 8,000 patients over almost 50 years as far as surgical outcomes. And what they found was about 70 to 80 percent improvement after surgery across the board. So this is a surgical disease. If people are consistently symptomatic over time, adults and kids, um, they, we have not shown better outcomes with watching them than with surgery. This paper implied that kids do better. There was a trend in several of the papers they looked at, but it really hasn't been compared in groups. Um, this paper also suggested um, that kids do better, but if you actually read the paper, contrary to the, the title, they really didn't compare natural spontaneous history with surgical outcomes in kids. So it's something we kind of by gestalt thought, but it hasn't really been shown. Which brings it to our work. So looking at um, kids in comparison uh, to young adults and um, older adults. So we had, um, of the uh, patients that I had done between April 2008 and the end of December of 2014, um, 206 patients. We excluded patients who had been operated on before. Um, we, it's only Chiari 1 malformation patients. Patients who subsequently had a, a cord untethering at an outside facility were excluded because that could alter um, their, their outcome and their symptomatology. So with the exclusions, we ended up with 144 patients that we were able to reach who hadn't moved away, um, you know, hadn't changed phone numbers or whatever. And they all had at least two years follow-up, some as much as eight years. 131 females, 13 males. And we split them into these three groups, uh, group A, um, 0 to 18 years of age, group B, 19 to 40 years of age, and group C, over 41. Um, their symptoms are as shown, uh, as expected, the most common symptom is headache, uh, Valsalva-induced headache, but they presented with all of these symptoms. Um, this is um, just a, a representative patient. This is a seven-year-old uh, with Chiari and syrinx that I had done. And my approach is generally the same with all of them. 
uh, suboccipital craniectomy, C1 laminectomy, duraplasty. I always either resect or shrink the tonsils, usually a combination of both, and open up the fourth ventricle. And this patient, over about six months, her syrinx resolved or decreased. Okay, so we found the Chicago outcome scale to be very useful in looking at these patients. This is developed by um, Dr. Frem's group in Chicago, and uh, it's been published, it's been validated. It's a good way of correlating uh, patients who have very disparate symptoms. Are they better? Are they unchanged or are they worse? So uh, for those who aren't familiar with this, basically you get a scale of one to four in each category, pain, non-pain, functional uh, status, and complications. Um, so one, the patient is worse, so the worst score you can get is four. Um, two, they're unchanged. Three, they're better, but they still have some problems. And then four um, means that their symptoms resolve, their non-pain symptoms resolve, they're back to school work, um, and no complications. So overall, if someone has a scale of 13 to 16, they're better. Um, 9 to 12, they're unchanged, and 4 to 8 would be worse. So these were our outcomes by age group. And as you can see, the 0 to 19, um, 0 to 18 kids did very well, um, 15 out of 16 on average. Um, a lot of 16s in the group. 19 to 40, um, just under 14, so still better. And then the older adults were still better, um, over 13. Overall in the total group, outcome was 14 out of 16, which is improved. Over time, um, we looked at them as far as early post-op, two weeks, a month, three months, six months, and at two years um, or more. And the kids, did well, and they consistently just did well. Um, they really didn't get worse over time. The um, older adults, you know, came back at that first post-op appointment. They're great. They're fantastic. You know, I wish I'd done this, you know, years before. And then sometimes, you know, they got a little worse again. They got uh, some of the pre-op symptoms back. They never said that they were as bad as before. They're very clear about that. But sometimes they, you know, struggled a little around a year, and then by a year and a half to two years, then they were doing well again. And of course, you're still seeing them at that point, because anybody who's not fine is still seeing you. So we're able to say that. And then the younger adults were in the middle over time. Um, just looking at the individual categories, um, again, the kids were consistently the best. But the older adults did almost as well as the younger adults. And we did not see an increase in complications in operating on patients who were older. And this, the, um, and this uh, slide, this is just showing sort of a distribution of their outcome scores over ages, our oldest patient being 65. Okay. So we wonder what, what makes the difference, you know, why do kids do better? And so we looked at the duration of symptoms, and what we found, this is kind of intuitive, but we were able to quantify it. The average duration of symptoms in group A was much shorter. Kids tended to be symptomatic for an average of two years. Um, the younger adults and the older adults actually were symptomatic seven to eight years, so there wasn't that much of a difference between the adult groups. But this difference was highly statistically significant um, in terms of outcome. Basically, if people are not, it's at least implied, if people are not symptomatic for an extended period of time, if they go ahead and have surgery, then they get better. So um, overall, um, what we can conclude, I think, is that all patients can get better with decompression. Um, the kids do very well, but you're never too old to benefit from surgical decompression either. Um, if kids are consistently symptomatic, we definitely recommend surgery. We don't do prolonged conservative therapy for them. And conversely, the older adults can do just as well as younger adults without necessarily an increase in complications. And that's what I have.
Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Gilmer? Yes. Very interesting. Is it possible that the way that the children answer the questions is different than the way the adults answer the questions? Um, that's the nice thing about our Chiari outcome scale. It really takes away that kind of variability. Um, is the kid in school or not? Do they miss school frequently? Um, are, were they unable to go to school or work? Um, or are they just fine? So that takes away a lot of that. Um, are you ever giving them anything for headaches? Whereas before you were. So um, I, I don't think so. Um, it was an interesting graph with the dots when they go kind of down and then kind of back up. And so the question is, um, like this. It's known that adults of that age lose a lot of stem cells uh, and kids have a lot of them. So uh, did anybody think of a stem cell therapy? Because I mean, it may be just that when the regeneration process has to kick in, there is still inflammatory and your adults are not doing well because of that, but then with time they gain it. What if you do a stem cell therapy in the beginning of postal. Was, that's that's that fascinating. I mean, that's that's an interesting thought. We'd have to think about how we're delivering them, um, uh, whether you would do it at the time of surgery. Um, we know that the, um, the dorsal columns appear more affected, right? Uh, right after surgery, patients have difficulty with numbness, tingling sometimes, proprioception, um, which is directly where they're compressed by tonsillar herniation. Yeah, it wouldn't be that hard to just lay something there at the time of surgery. So I mean, it's certainly a thought. But again, another direction for research, I would think. Thank you very much. I'm the veterinary neurosurgeon along with Dr. Lewin. So we have a similar study, and it's exciting to see our results match. We looked at age. Well, one of the things we looked at was dural biopsies. I'm curious, and, and I brought this up at a previous meeting. I was surprised to find out that when the folks I spoke to did dural decompressions, they didn't submit it for biopsy. And we submit everything for biopsy. So we have histologic evaluation of the dura that was reset at the time of the decompression on several hundred patients. And we're trying to look to see if the changes, which range from lymphocytic, plasmacytic, uh, to dystrophic mineralization to fibro well, fibrosis, then dystrophic mineralization. Some, some thought that that may relate to duration of clinical signs, maybe it affects outcome, this type of thing. Does anyone look at, did you look at, or does anyone in the room look at dural biopsies and histologic changes of the dura and try to associate it with chronicity of clinical signs, this type of thing? Um, I have not. If, I usually resect the tonsils in a subpeel fashion to preserve the arteries. If there are no crossing pica branches, I will resect the tonsil and block and send it. Um, you know, usually we're seeing ischemic changes, we're seeing some dysmorphic changes. Um, but I think that's related to Chiari in general. Um, we certainly haven't correlated that with length of, of symptoms. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. Um, when I was at Duke, we did that. We sent the, the Dura off of genetics teams, hoping that the Dura would give us some more local genetic profile difference because the blood wasn't giving those answers. And it wasn't really very fruitful. Uh, the Dura uh, surprised. I had the same spell you did. The Dura is right against the tonsils, but now we're sending bone because it may be more in the bone. So we don't really quite know what, what the source is that we should look at. Part of the tonsils, but we can't do that. Sorry, one more question. Sure, uh, definitely. We now have some data uh, out of our Akron group. Uh, Frank and I in our extended group and this is a fairly large sample of over 800 people. And about half of them are decompressed and half of them are not decompressed. And it gets at your issue. The non-decompressed people have higher anxiety, depression, and stress scores from the DAS-21 compared to the decompressed. Even though presumably before decompression, the ones that were decompressed would have had higher. However, they're both really high. Now, is it possible that since you're having people refer it, 
and they're saying, well, I feel better, but they're not anywhere close, perhaps, to a baseline. Is that possible? I think, it, I think it's certainly possible. You know, a lot of the time these patients have had, you know, symptoms for so long, and they've been questioning it, and they, any little thing that happens afterwards, they start thinking it's coming back. And, you know, it can kind of spiral, it can build itself. The only thing that convinces them that they're going to get better is when they get better, and they stay better. Um, there certainly is a significant anxiety um, among these patients, and I actually don't operate on them if the anxiety is out of control. I mean, we've all had this, you know, you, you walk in and talk to a patient and they just start crying. And you haven't even said anything yet. I say, you're not ready for surgery. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really, I, I don't think that you have to unless somebody is passing out or, you know, um, going paralyzed on one side of the body, you know, sort of um, really um, alarming symptoms. Otherwise, they just need to wait until they're ready. Thank you.